All right, Melissa, you ready to get this started? Yeah, let's go. Thanks everybody for joining us today. We're really excited about having you all here today. AC is going through this side right here and completely around to the DC. We're gonna go through our five top recommendations. When they actually have the power supply up there, and it could be several years, it could also be a few months. And TRC, we are, we're a specialty partner, right? We hey, hey, Melissa, before you go, we're claiming to be experts. We don't just make this claim. How do we train and bring people up to that level of expertise? Okay, that's a, that's a great question. And uh, when they incorporated the liquid-cooled power supplies into their system, they didn't need to buy a new trailer. They didn't need to uh, do any uh, innovative design on their end. So they were able yeah. to they were able to take um, the existing cooling uh, mechanism they had. All right, hello everybody. Welcome to this month's Power Show Live. Today, our topic is the top five strategies for conquering a recession. And I'm going to welcome the president, the CEO of TRC Electronics, Stephen Lagomarsino. How you doing today, Melissa? How are you doing, everybody? Excellent. All right, very good. So we're going to get started here today. My intention here is to share with you the top five strategies that I've accumulated over the 25 years being in the electronics industry and uh, working with TRC Electronics. And these five strategies are going to be the top five that you can use and leverage so that you could conquer a recession or just simply a market downturn, even if it isn't a recession. I know there's a lot of uh, fear and anxiety in the uh, in the country right now because there's so much negative news about the economy and inflation and interest rates rising and the cost of living increasing. So uh, I'm going to guys get you guys gu guided in here and focused in on what you need to be focused on if you're a business owner or if you're a business leader here. So let's get started here. I'm going to share my screen and walk you through my playbook. Okay. All right. So we're going to top, we're going to cover the top five strategies here. We're going to start with, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of what we're looking at here. Uh, you know, 98% of CEOs surveyed right now expect a recession, and uh, I'm going to show you how you can make that uh, decision and uh, analyze data for yourself, and you can determine whether or not you think there's a risk of a contraction in the economy or even worse, a recession, instead of listening to all the uh, economic contributors and the punder, pundits on news that are uh, have their opinions and they let's let's be real here. They also have to make it entertaining. So we're going to be a little bit more pragmatic so you can analyze data. So we're going to get started here first. With a little bit of background here. For those of you that I haven't had the pleasure of uh, being introduced to before, my name is Stephen Lagomarsino and the president of TRC Electronics. And I've experienced three recessions during my time here at TRC Electronics. Uh, this began with the 2001 recession, the Great Recession of 2007 and 2009, and also the most recent 2020 COVID-19 recession. And a couple of things you're going to see that I'm going to walk you through here today is that you want to play offense when you're in business. You want to be on the offensive side of the ball as much as possible. You don't do not want to get into a defensive posture. And you also do not want to react with fear when you're going through, whether it's just simply a downturn or you're having some struggles in your business or we're, we have a, an economic recession. You want to approach them strategically. And one thing you need to remember here is that an economy always rebounds. So no matter how bad things get at any specific time in an economic downturn, you need to have the context that there's going to be a rebound. And in the long term, the U.S. economy and the global economy always rebounds and grows. So we want to be ready for downturns. They are out of our control, and we want to focus on the things that we can control. Now. TRC Electronics specifically, we focus on the U.S. manufacturing industry, and I would it's safe to bet that most of the viewers on this show are involved one way or another in the U.S. manufacturing industry. 
These are the clients that we serve. Uh, the global, the U.S. GDP in 2022 is estimated to be about $25 trillion in GDP, and manufacturing is approximately 10% of that. Now, electronic industry plays a leading role in U.S. manufacturing, and TRC Electronics serves businesses that are in the electronics industry. So let's start with strategy number one to conquer a recession. And this is really important for me because part of conquering a recession is even seeing the early warning signs. And as a business owner or a business leader, you need to have business cycle awareness. And I, my goal here is to increase your business cycle awareness. Now, when I say business cycle, there's cycles in the business in economy. We're either contracting or we're expanding. So you always want to be aware of where we are in the cycle, and you don't want to ignore the cycles because you need to know this to make informed decisions. Now, when the economy is expanding, you may take some uh, different risks than when it's contracting, and your strategies in the expanding economy should be slightly different dur than during a contracting economy. And how do we identify this? Well, first, internally in your organization, you should be able to identify some KPIs that are leading indicators. And what are yours? I could give you an example at TRC Electronics. One of our leading indicators would be our sales pipeline. So we can monitor and take snapshots of the total dollar value and number of opportunities in our sales pipeline. That is going to indicate our future revenue because our sales pipeline converts into uh, contracts or bookings, and then ultimately those bookings converts into revenue that we ship to our clients. Now, in your organization, uh, you want to be able to have a good number of leading indicators that give you an indication that things might not be uh, headed in the right direction. It could be monitoring the number of proposals that you're issuing. It could be monitoring the number of leads that you're generating. Uh, it could also be number of new contracts. So first, in look internally, make sure that you have your KPIs identified and which one of them are leading indicators because some KPIs are lagging indicators and don't give you indication of future success. So if you haven't worked on that, I recommend you do that and you should always be monitoring them on a weekly uh, basis. In addition to that, I recommend peer-to-peer -peer comparisons. There's other uh, companies in your industry whether they're competitors, whether you're friendly with them, you should be get measuring peer-to-peer -peer comparisons from time to time. This way, if you're experiencing success and your peers are not, or you're experiencing some struggles and your peers are not, maybe you're doing something right, or maybe you're doing something that's not right, and it's not necessarily the business cycle, but it could be something that's happening within your organization. Alternatively, if you're seeing things going really well and everyone else is too, you know, okay, we, we've got the we've got a tailwind right now. The wind's at our backs and we, we're in an expansion period of the business cycle. But if you're struggling and so are your peers, okay, you may have a little bit of reinsurance. Okay, something's shifting in the business cycle right now. Maybe we're not contracting. Maybe the, the rate of contraction is slowing down or maybe we're uh, excuse me, maybe we're not expanding or the rate of expansion is slowing down, or maybe we're actually contracting. Uh, and remember, we could be contracting. That doesn't mean it's a recession. We just not, we could be uh, growing, uh, not growing, and it's for a short time, that contraction. And also, if you listen to too much of the news, you're going to be discouraged and confused. So you want to analyze the data and draw your own conclusion, because if you listen to the news, as I mentioned earlier, you, they're going to drive you crazy. And I'm going to show you some industry macroeconomic trends that you can monitor here today that will be very valuable, especially in the U.S. manufacturing industry. Now, let's just remember business cycles are normal. So you're, this is comes with the this comes uh, as part of the game here. So you're going to have expansion and contraction. You're going to have a peak and you're going to have a trough, but in long term the economy expands. 
and you can't control uh, uh, contractions, you can't control a recession, you have to understand that that comes every five or so years, we're going to have either a recession or some type of uh, contraction. And I can show you that long-term growth despite business cycles is still possible. And I illustrated here to provide you a lot of transparency with TRC Electronics in the time that I've been here for 25 years, the long-term revenue growth that we've experienced despite uh, going through three recessions during that time and potentially a fourth year in 2023. So the positive news is even with periods of contraction in the long term, the economy expands and you could grow your business. Now, as I go through this uh, presentation here today, I actually have a, um, a free copy of a recession playbook. Uh, there's a QR code here. I encourage you to download that and you can go through, you can read that along this uh, webinar here or use it later. It's got a lot of gold in there and I highly recommend you download it. It's totally free. And uh, we I put that out there for everybody to help everybody get through any downturns or possible recessions. Okay, first, uh, I talked about having some uh, data that you can analyze, that you could be analytical and make your own decisions about whether or not we're going to be in a recession and not depend on people in the, uh, in the news to be providing that type of information for you. Okay, the bellwether, uh, first I wanna say I'm not an economist, right? But as an entrepreneur, I've learned to understand what I need to monitor in my industry so that I can understand where we are in the business cycle and make proper strategic decisions and assessments of our performance, because I would expect our performance to be much better during a contraction if it's a, we get explosive uh, growth in the economy. So the ISM report on manufacturing, this is the bellwether report for us here in the United States that are serving or operating in the electronics uh, in the manufacturing industry. Now, this here, this report is very comprehensive. Uh, there's a link to the report uh, in my uh, recession playbook. I put a lot of links in there for a lot of these uh, uh, websites that I'm going to be going through. And this report is released the first business day of every single month at 10 a.m. And this first thing I'm doing, first business day of every month, I'm, I'm getting the report. I wanna see what the measurement is because I always wanna be aware. And maybe I want to be more aware of what things are when we're when I sense there's possibly a downturn. So the, this ISM report provides an index uh, 50. It's going to be uh, either above 50 or below 50. Any number above 50 is an indicator of um, of expansion in manufacturing in the United States. Any number below 50 is going to show uh, is going to say contraction. Now, what's really important with this is no, don't just read the number because the overall number is, uh, is valuable. But if you want to get a leading indicator, what I do is I go within the report and I keep an, uh, an eye on a couple things here. One, I want to see what the trend, monthly trend is. Is the monthly trend decreasing? Is it stabilized or is it increasing? Because that will give me an idea of where we're potentially headed. In addition to that, I want to look at what the new orders, uh, they, they'll have a measurement specifically for new factory orders. So new orders is a leading indicator because I know new orders will lead to future revenue and future GDP. So if shipments are good, but new orders are decreasing and contracting, that could be a, a predictor, an indicator that we are going to be going into a period where the, the overall number in future months can be below 50 and we could possibly be able, uh, have some contraction in the U.S. manufacturing. So most important report, if you take one report that you monitor in this industry, this is the one report you want to monitor. And the link is in my recession playbook. And that, again, that, that uh, playbook is entirely free for you guys. So I'm going to go through some other here reports uh, that I'm going to summarize a bunch of them. Every single one of these, uh, I go into good detail, a good summary detail of each what, what each of these represents. Uh, the ISM report on manufacturing I just mentioned. Now, there's other more regional reports that I'm going to just uh, overview here. 
And what's the value of these? There's other manufacturing reports that are done by different feds uh, throughout the country. Well, the timing of these reports, some of them are different. So you could get a reading at different times of the month. And uh, one was came out today and one came out yesterday, which I'll, I'll, I'll just show you and I'll illustrate that for you. And are also more regional. So these are more regional. So you, you can even figure out on a regional uh, basis, uh, such as the New York State, State uh, Fed Empire State Manufacturing Survey, you'll be able to specifically see what's happening in a particular region, such as New York State. So the Dallas Fed conducts a Texas Manufacturing Outlook Survey, and they're providing factory output in that particular region. Uh, thirdly, on the bullet point there, we have the Kansas City uh, Fed Manufacturing Survey. This monitors uh, plants selecting according to that geographic distribution, and they pick a different mix of industries and sizes of, uh, of manufacturers there. The Philadelphia Fed Manufacturing Business Outlook, that's also a monthly survey of manufacturers, and that's actually manufacturers that are located in what they call the Third Federal Reserve District. Uh, the New York Empire State, that's my monthly survey, as I mentioned earlier, of simply New York State manufacturers of different size manufacturers. There's uh, NAM, which is uh, uh, has a quarterly survey of small, medium, and large manufacturers outlook. So this is a survey that's done quarterly that I like to monitor. And we have the, uh, the conference board leading indicator uh, economic index. This is really good because they actually take 10 different components of the economy and they mix it into a blend and it's proven to be really accurate indicator of the economy. In our industry, especially copper futures is important. So this serves as a good barometer of economic health overall and electronics needs copper, of course. So history has shown that each recession um, over the past 30 years has been preceded by a bear market of copper. So in a bear market is when the uh, when that that the value of copper drops 50, excuse me, 20 percent from its uh, from its high. And we have had that happen here over the past 12 months. Another th uh, good barometer is 10-year treasury constant maturity minus two-year. So this every single economic uh, recession over the past 50 years here in the U.S. has been preceded by an inverted yield curve. So this is another good indicator. And we have a couple other labor markets, which um, unemployment's lagging, but you can monitor the uh, jobless, the rolling four weeks average of jobless claims, uh, if they're if they approach 250k rolling four weeks average, you know you have some possible trouble in the economy. We monitor CPI and PPI. That's your consumer price index and producer price index, which, as we know, has exploded over the past 18 months with inflation. And an inflation and employment combination is a correlation. Uh, between inflation and unemployment. So this is something you can watch. Um, we know that since 1955, whenever inflation is greater than 4% uh, and unemployment is lower than 5%, the economy has slipped into a recession within two years. So as you can see, I go through all, I monitor these, there are more data points to monitor, but this is what I find very useful. And now I can tune out the news and I can monitor this and I have data and I can compare this data to what hist historically meant. And I don't have one data point, I have several data points. And then I can make my own decisions about where the economy might be headed. Now the economy might be, might be showing great news and okay, my strategy might be a little bit different here now because I see we're gonna take different risks because we've, we're going into like more growth. Or I can see a slowdown. It may not be a recession, but I can see it slowing down. Or, hey, this does not look good, so we got to be prepared. It's going to get more challenging. It's going to get harder. We have the context that uh, it looks like we're going in the wrong direction, and potentially we're going into a recession. So, uh, as promised, here's a couple examples that I can provide you guys. A couple of readings. So, just yesterday, the New York State, uh, New York Fed Empire State Manufacturing Survey release their data. 
And what I did was I showed you their data over the past um, 15 years or so. And if you look at that chart, you can see the gray shaded area is recession. So you can see when their uh, number falls below uh, zero, they have what's called the diffusion index. You need to be aware of that. That's potentially signaling a recession. So their data that came out yesterday, uh, it gives you the general business conditions of uh, New York State manufacturing. They came out with a minus 32.9 reading, and it was the lowest level since uh, the uh, COVID recession in 2020, and it was the fifth worst reading in the survey's history. So, okay, that's one data point. Now, I can take that data point, and I can use that with other data points and make my own decisions about where I think the economy may or may not be headed. Today, just today, uh, the Philadelphia Fed Manufacturing Business Outlook Survey released their data. So back-to-back -back days, and this is in the middle of the month. So this is good. I'm getting some reading points here. Again, I'm showing you here the past 15 years or so, their data, gray shaded area shows a recession. And you can see they, they have two readings. One is future activity and current activity. And you can see that they're a little, uh, another thing, another diffusion index below zero would be a negative reading and above zero would be a positive reading. And the, for the past uh, few months, uh, three of the last four months, they've been below zero on current activity. Okay, another data point. So I've got to watch this now. And finally here, uh, well, third of four th readings I'm going to show you that are recent is the conference board leading indicator economic index for the U.S. So the conference board is a nonprofit independent organization that surveys businesses. All right, this is another one here where we're going back of almost 20 something years, 24 years. The gray areas shaded are recessions. We look at the blue line, which is the year over year reading of the survey. The gray lines is uh, the measurement of gross uh, year over year change in GDP, real GDP. So if I look here, the most recent reading here in 2023, you could see how it's dropping. So now if I look at the history of this, every time it dropped severely, what ended up happening in the economy? So there's a recession every time. Now, if this was an outlier and it was one data point in one reading, then I, I would I would understand that and take into that and excuse me take that into consideration. But I'm all right. I've got multiple data points now. I can make my own. Can, I can start making my own conclusions about where we're headed. And finally, in terms of an example of a data point, as I mentioned here, the ten-year Treasury constant maturity minus ten-year Treasury constant maturity. What's the difference? Do I have an inverted yield curve? Because every recession for the past. 50 years has been preceded by an inverted yield curve. So you can see the gray points in, uh, that are recessions and you can see the drop below zero be the, represent an inverted yield curve. And you can see every time a recession happens, uh, except for 2020, it did drop but very shortly because that was such a quick recession. But you can see where we are right now, the, the yield curve is uh, definitely inverted and it's been inverted for some time now. And by the way, Melissa, if anyone has any questions, I should have mentioned earlier, type them in the chat, raise your hand, make sure that I, you know, clarify anything that anybody would like to clarify. So here's four, what I provide you here was four examples of some data points of how you can have some business cycle awareness. So if you're running a business, you need to know what type of environment you're working in. Uh, anything you're doing here, you just get, you need to be aware of that. We, so, do have, we have a question in the chat, Stephen. Go for it. Okay, who is it? It is Ron. So from Bridgecom. Okay, okay, Ron. So what do I see happening with the Trump tariffs? Uh, so that's a great question, especially for us in the electronics industry. I see nothing happening right now because that's politically uh, not uh, a I think that's probably like a little bit of a, a bomb there politically for anybody to touch. So unfortunately in the electronics industry, the, ta the tariffs have kind of been incorporated into what was what's expected in the US and uh, that's kind of been normalized a little bit. So I think that's a real hot button. I don't see that happening with the, with the current administration that's in the place right now. I don't, do not see them touching that right now. So I, I don't expect that to go anywhere. 
great question. Thanks, Ron. Okay, so, uh, and Melissa, next time we'll I'll mute them so we can have a discussion, okay? And we'll make sure that I answer Ron's question too. Hey, Ron, let's just make sure I answered Ron's question. I know he's on here still. I'm gonna unmute him. Hey, Ron, you there, buddy? Hey, Steve, can you hear me now? I, I hear you now, what's yeah. up, man? Hey, Did I answer yeah, your hey, question? I'm sorry. Did I, did I answer your question? I want to yeah, make sure. I mean, I it, it's, yes, generally speaking, yes. I mean, I, I've done some research on these tariffs, which, of course, you know, I'm having to deal with this nonsense. If you and um, what's what's happening is that the what what I've wondered is strategically how these costs are borne by Americans affected. I mean, because the the what 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 I've learned is that it was a it was a very it was a lie. These these tariffs are not borne by China. They're borne by us as uh, importers. And then we of course pass these these costs on to America if we can. And I'm challenged to pass these costs on to my customers because the uh, like for example, you you sell the Meanwell uh, product, which of course they have these costs. And how to make that to where everybody plays on the same, they're on the same playing field is what I've discovered is that okay. they're not, and yeah, it just, it just I just, they're, they're, they're very, it just creates a big headache. And I understand like how to navigate that in, in your opinion, because I noticed like you're just, yeah, you, you yeah. Just straight up tell them the cost and that's the, well, you know. Yeah, you're being transparent. So what the, right. the, the, the only solution here, you be transparent. We're transparent with it, and that's what the industry's done. Uh, and if you could find an alternative solution that's manufactured in another country that's going to be a uh, price advantage over China made with tariffs, then that's the route you got to go. But right now, China's still that competitive. They, you know, they know how to play with their uh, currency, and it's they're still competitive even with the tariffs, unfortunately. So right now it's just the tax revenue for the government. <laughs> That's the way it's working. And, and what it's happening, it's being passed along to the US manufacturers, which are ultimately passing it along to the consumer. And um, yeah, it's gonna be with us for at least a few more years probably, Ron. Well, the, the only thing I've done to combat this, I did write my congressman a letter uh, indicating that, you know, look, hey, this is an issue. Uh, the cost of these things is probably, it's very difficult to discern, but yet, yeah. we, you know, they have, there's been studies to, you know, so I just, I did my part. But, That's all you um, can do. You got to vote. <laughs> well, and you know, the, the thing that I'm like your products and I'm sure mine, they're not, uh, in my opinion, a threat to national security, which is where the section 301. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just curious how you were, you're just, it's just transparency. Hey, this is the way it is. And, and yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and we're seeking uh, suppliers that are manufacturing outside of uh, China. But even though th they're still not as competitive as China, unfortunately, but that's we've okay. uh, we created a monster. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it is a it is like the third rail. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Ron. I appreciate yep. it, buddy. Good seeing you on here, Ron. Ron's got some awesome radios that he sells at Bridgecom Systems. What's your website address, Ron? Oh, who muted him? Type it in the chat, Ron. Oh, it's uh, it's bridgecomsystems.com. There you go. Very we, good. We, we sell products to the land mobile radio industry, and we also sell two-way radio repeaters, and I'm a customer of Steve's. I buy power supplies through his uh, company. Uh, so, yeah, we get we can, we became partners. So, yeah, All right, that's it. Man. But anyway, thanks, Steve. Have good a great seeing day. you, Ron. Yeah, you, you too. Okay. All right, so now let's get on to uh, risk management. This is the second part. So the first part to conquer recession is you got to increase your business cycle awareness, okay? You need to know what, what type of environment you're playing in. Number two is risk management and finances. So in a, uh, in a contracting economy and recession, your assets will become liabilities, okay? So think about this. Some of your accounts receivable if you have, if you extend credit to customers, some of your order backlog that can become a liability. So potentially customers who irresponsibly ordered, over ordered, 
or were struggling to pay their bills when things were good are going to become liabilities now where you looked at that as an asset on your balance sheet, but some of that is going to become a liability. And you need to be aware of that and manage that risk and approach it that way. Uh, in addition, inventory planning. So you need to be staying ahead of the business cycle. So if you're not aware of what the business cycle is, you're going to potentially overorder your, for inventory. Or if the, if the business cycle indicates that it's going to be ex, an ex, period of expansion coming, you could be posi not positioned correctly and you can underorder and not be ready for that expansion like we just saw here over the past 18 months. Another thing, uh, another strategy here with risk management is financial planning. So uh, my philosophy here with a business is well, the cash reserves, minimum of six months on hand for your ex operating expenses. So when we, this is something you want to have planned before you go into a recession, you want to have cash reserves on hand in your business of a minimum of six months. And I would only recommend a maximum of 15 months. And the reason I say there's a maximum of 15 months is because once you go above 15 months, you know, there's some loss opportunity where that cash or capital could have been better used investing in other aspects of your business or releasing cash from your business as a business owner and investing that somewhere else. So have between six and 15 months of working capital in your business so you can handle any kind of ups and downs. Uh, now, one uh, exception to that might be if acquisition is part of your strategy and growth, then you want to have extra cash on hand so that when there is a downturn and you can go purchase and acquire a competitor that might be struggling and get a good deal, then in that case, having more than 15 months cash makes a lot of sense. Another strategy here is having a revolving line of credit on hand. So when I, we have a revolving line of credit that's um, secured by our assets, but we don't use it. And this is the way you need to approach a line of credit. It's your insurance. It's an insurance policy. It's a cash insurance policy. It's not something you're going to use unless you absolutely 100% need it. It's not going to substitute for your cash reserves, but you have that insurance policy available. So what I would recommend, if you do not already have that, you want to make sure that you're growing a business, you're showing great profitability, profitability growth. Uh, create a good relationship with your bank and work on getting a revolving line of credit. Now, if you don't have that already, approach the bank. If they're not willing to give that to you, you don't qualify, find out what you need to do and make sure that you're working towards that because that's a great insurance policy, just like you have all different types of insurance for your business uh, and other aspects. Also, annual budget risk management. If you don't have a budget for your organization, how could you manage your risks? So if you don't have a budget already, you need to be creating a budget. So what we do here at TRC Electronics, we create a low, mid, and high target. And we, we put financial situations for all three targets. And when we financially budget for the year, we budget to the low target, but we're aiming for the high. So this way, we know our worst case scenario financially, this is what we're, we, we're good and we're financially budgeted for that worst case scenario, but we shoot for the best case scenario. Another thing here in terms of finances, uh, especially during a recession, this becomes very handy, is being able to monitor your profit and loss statement. So if you're a business owner, you need to learn how to read a P&L and understand it, and you need to watch that like a hawk. You shouldn't need to rely on an accounting expert, your accountant, or someone in your accounting department to interpret your P&L when you look at an overview of your P&L. You need to be able to monitor that P&L and understand what's driving your profit in your organization, what's possibly or lack of thereof of profit in your organization so that you can drive that profit. Do not rely on someone else to interpret a P&L for you. That's something I'll look at weekly. And I've done that for 25 years, constantly looking at a P&L. Balance sheet is really important as well. So especially during a recession, you want to monitor that balance sheet, and the balance sheet is going to show you where your capital is tied up. Now, you may show profit on paper in your P&L, and it looks great, but where's the money? Is it in a bank? Is it tied up in uh, inventory? 
Is it tied up in accounts receivable? Make sure that you're monitoring your balance sheet and, and ensure during a downturn that your capital is not getting tied up where you don't have it available to use when you need it. Uh, additionally, AR collections. Now, when you uh, go through a downturn, you look, companies are going to um, are going to struggle here a little bit. And when companies go through a downturn and struggle, if you're extending credit, such as net 30 days, you're going to start getting extended. And those organizations who may have paid late under great expanding circumstances are certainly going to struggle now when the economy contracts. So you need to be aware of who they are. You need to watch uh, their credit. You might want to tighten up the credit limit a little bit more. You're going to be less risk adverse in a contracting economy with versus a uh, expanding economy. So you need to be able to have awareness of where you're at so your collection strategy will change a little bit and you're communicating that with your uh, with your accounting team. Stephen, we, I did read it, I have a direct question here that came in. Go for it. Uh, it was uh, regarding the line of credit. So businesses, you making a recommendation here to have a revolving line of credit. When would um, a business owner want to tap into that? What are some specific uh, reasons? Yeah, right. So that that's emergency. That, that that's insurance. When when uh, you know what hits the fan financially, and you don't have, like for instance, let's say that you made a mistake and you. Uh, you've overordered and you have too much inventory and now you've got a bill due, but you've got good inventory. It's like unfortunate. It's going to take me longer than I have more than I need. And it's going to take me some time to sell that inventory, but I, it's good inventory. We're going to sell it, but we really didn't plan well. We got caught off guard and now we don't have the funds. We went through our cash reserves and we, we need to pay a bill. Okay. I'm going to tap into that line of credit. Uh, that that's where you would tap in that line of credit, pay the bill, you'll get AR collected in, you know, in a couple of weeks or a few weeks, a month, and then you're going to pay down that line of credit. So that's the type of line, that revolving line of credit, something you can access and reaccess. You're only going to access it for short periods of time. You don't want to be accessing that for long extended period of times. So it's just to fill in a small gap. Same thing if maybe somebody in AR collections is extending you and, oh boy, you know, it was a big invoice or big customer, and they're really extending us. And now we, we went through some of our cash reserves and I need to just bridge the gap. That's where we would use that. Okay, so let's go um, mitigate risk. Okay, so this is something here at TRC Electronics we started doing many months ago, almost a year ago. And why? Well, we were, we, we were watching what was happening and we had business cycle awareness, and we saw the signs coming of what was happening. So we, we started to secure larger orders and contracts or higher risk ones with our clients with deposits. Number one, there's a couple of reasons that works. Number one, well, you're going to remove some of the risk because you just got to receive a, a deposit for it. So you have some cash. And number two, it ensures that the client has a higher degree of confidence because now they're making a greater commitment with your organization to secure that contract or that order. And some examples might be where just the dollar value is very high. It might be a product that the quantity that this client is purchasing is a not a kind of quantity that can be resold easily in the marketplace because maybe they're buying 5,000 pieces of a particular product in our organization only sells 100 a year. So if something went wrong, it would take us 50 years to sell this or whatever, or five years. Um, so these are types of situations where it's a custom modified particular product specifically for them. Now in this type of, uh, when we're gonna go through tougher times, we're gonna be a little less risk averse here. So we're gonna mitigate some of that risk. It's also important for to provide total clarity and transparency with your contracts here. So make sure that when you're quoting customers, making proposals, that they understand what the T's and C's are, terms and conditions. Is this item special order? Is it not cancelable, non-returnable? What are what are the policies? Make sure that's that's very transparent. And on the flip side, make sure any types of contracts that you're entering into with your suppliers and vendors, you're completely aware 
of what those terms and conditions are. And let's say that you're in a contract where you regret you're in it, things have changed, and now you no longer have the need. What I would recommend you do is approach your supplier, your vendor, provide transparency, see if there's an opportunity to negotiate it. But one thing I would not recommend is breaking those contracts because you've made a commitment. And what's more important is your long-term relationships you have with, with partners and also your, your, uh, your reputation in the industry. So attempt to work together, find some common ground where it could be a win-win situation. But if all that fails, make sure that you're meeting your contractual commitments that you've committed to as an organization. Okay, uh, and also break even point. Look, just make sure you always know your break even point. It's not something we dwell on a lot here, but I, you don't ever want to get blindsided with financial surprise because you didn't realize what your break even point. I go through that a little bit more detailed in my playbook here that you guys can download. Okay, uh, yep, yeah, just a reminder here, guys, here's the playbook. You, you can scan that code here. Some, I'm sure, uh, if you haven't already typed the URL in the chat, guys, make sure it's there so that everyone can download that free playbook. Okay, number three strategy is marketing. You know, I laugh when I hear people are gonna cut marketing because the economy is, uh, is contracting or business isn't as good. Look, marketing, despite what your profit and loss statement says that marketing is an expense, Marketing is an essential investment. So you do not stop investing because the economy is bad. You, so what I would recommend you do here is you want to examine your return on ad spend. Okay, what? make sure that you're critical of the different campaigns you're running. Do more of what's providing a high return on ad spend and do less of what's returning a low uh, return on ad spend. I would suggest that you try to improve what's not working or working pretty good, but make improvements here, but do not stop in investing in marketing ever as never an option for your company. You might as well just close the doors if that's what you're going to do. Another strategy here, when you have a downturn, a, all of your existing clients might not be ready to purchase as frequently as they have traditionally. We'll provide them educational content add value to nurture that long-term relationship, provide them value that they could use during that time and encourage your people in the organization to promote the organization on social media. There's no excuse. Uh, they should all be proud of the company that you're working for and the impact they're making out that, that the organization is making collectively as a team. Encourage your team to promote the organization on social media. And also you can pr uh, design promotional offers in marketing so that you can pull inventory, uh, excuse me, pull revenue forward. So when you have a little bit of slowdown, you wanna try and pull some revenue forward, uh, design and some exciting and valuable promotional offers that will incentivize clients to order sooner instead of waiting it out a little bit more. And finally, like what you need to do in marketing is constantly promote, promote, promote. Don't be transactional, especially right now. This isn't the time to only promote your products. You want to promote what you do, who you do it with, and why you do it and the impact that you're making. So just promote that transformational impact that your organization is making throughout the world. Fourth, sales strategy here. So want to conquer a recession? This is how you need to approach share, share, uh, Excuse me, sales. First and foremost, the if you're in a recession, you're contracting, you're not expanding, so you got to grab market share. And how do you grab market share? You're going to need to grab existing market share that's there, and you need to do that by increasing your outbound sales activities. Look, what it's going to be harder, and what works in an expanding market when business is just coming in, it seems, oh, wow, these orders are coming in, clients are growing, and it's just happening. It is not going to be the same when, when you have a recession. Clients are going to be much more stingier and cautious about ordering. They're not growing the way they were previously. So you need to go and attack the marketplace and go earn and grab that market share. Do not go dormant in sales. This is not a time to just wait it out. This is a time to get really super aggressive in your sales team. You want to stay engaged with your existing clients. Uh, even when they're not ready to make a purchase, hey, you need to add value. Make sure that you're taking care of them. 
Uh, what I would do is here when you're uh, when you're in a downturn with existing clients, they're not ready to purchase. Find out how they enjoyed their experience working with you. What could the experience? What could have improved the experience? When's the last time you called up clients and said, "Hey, you know, you've been working with us. I have just one question for you today. What could have we have done to make the experience working with TRC Electronics better? What's that one thing? Find out because these are the opportunities." that will allow you to add more value to them so that then when they're ready, they're going to appreciate and find more value working with you. Also, you're going to hear bad news from clients. Some clients are going to struggle. They're going to give you some bad news and you need to remain positive even when you encounter setbacks with clients. So when your sales team is working with a client to hear some bad news, we've got to stay upbeat. We've got to stay positive. They're, they might tell you, oh, that big order we were going to send you for a million dollars next month, that project got canceled because of the economy. And you're not going to be too happy about it, but you got to remain positive. Also, I would highly recommend when you're leading or you have a sales team is you have to keep the, the morale high and the spirits high. Things will be harder now. It's going to be more of a grind. So you want to do things to make it fun and keep their spirits high. I would create uh, different types of sprints with fun competition. You want to run some sp uh, spiffs. You want to create a lot of sprints throughout the year. Don't think of it as one long marathon. Create a bunch of sprints. And also, what industries are thriving during uh, the downturn? Like it, uh, recessions always spark innovation. It happened during COVID. There, there was so much incredible innovation that happened that came out of that. Every downturn, every problem creates opportunities, and we're going to innovate. And there's always these industries, these little sectors that seem to outperform everyone else. Uh, there, th that varies what industry that is uh, during different during downturns. Find out what that is so that you can be capitalizing on that and going after that business and providing them the value that your organization can provide. And finally, in sales, this is the time to fill up your pipeline. You want to overload your pipeline. Even if you're not getting quite the sales results that you want today, these are the seeds you're going to plant so that when you get out of the downturn, you're going to slingshot out of that downturn. So plant the seeds, overload that pipeline with new opportunities so that when that downturn ends, you're going to slingshot out of it and you're going to grow a lot faster than you would have normally grown if you hadn't put that effort in and filled up that pipeline. Okay, this is one of my favorites here, leadership, right? Okay, the key word is resilience. If you're a leader, whether you're leading the entire organization or you're leading a department or a team within an organization, you must be resilient because your resilience will be tested when, it's, when there's a recession. One of the first things I would recommend doing is during a recession, provide your team context of where we are in the cycle right now. Look, things might be more challenging, but we're not lowering goals and targets because I'm not lowering my team members' goals and targets for them individually. So as a unit, we need to accomplish our team goals so that we all individually can accomplish our individual personal, professional, financial goals. So I would never lower the goals of my team members. So I'm certainly not going to lower the goals of my organization. This is an opportunity to unify the team. Look, you, there's nothing like an external threat from your organization that can unify your team. And here's the perfect one for you. A recession is an external threat. Give them something to believe in and be inspirational. Also, you need to display resilience and confidence here. If you don't believe, if you get a cold, <laughs> you're going to give your team a, a pneumonia. So you need to come in to show up every single day and be, be the beacon of hope that inspires every single team member in your organization, no matter how tough things get, no matter how, how hard things seem they are during a recession, you need to be the one that they can see the confidence in and believe in and know that everything's going to be okay and everything's actually going to be great because the truth of the matter it is because these recessions never last forever and there's always a beautiful recovery from them. The other thing with being a leader is you have to have a growth mindset. If you look at every problem as a problem, you are going to fail at leading. You have to understand that every problem 
as an opportunity there. So when you see a problem, that's great. What's the opportunity? Let's find it. It's all we have to do is open up our eyes and have the growth mindset to see the opportunity that is hidden behind a problem. So peel that problem apart and find the opportunity. Uh, be visible. This is not a time when the, there's a recession for you as a leader to disappear from the team. They need to see you now more than ever. So when things are tough, you need to be the most visible uh, out of all times because they're going to want to see that confidence. They're going to want to see their leader that's uh, that's visible for them. And in addition to that, I would uh, make sure that we're setting clear expectations. This is not a time when uh, there's a recession to be unclear about what the quantifiable performance metrics are for your team's success. You need to make sure if you haven't already done it and you're not clear about your expectations, this is an opportunity to realize, hey, you know what? We don't have this really figured out. We need to figure this out. Set clear expectations of what, it's, what, what the results are expected in a particular role and make them as quantifiable as possible. And in addition here, in terms of leadership, understand the performance levels of the team you lead. Like if you do not know who your top third is, your middle third and your bottom performers are, then you need to be finding that out now. Here's an example of a department where ranking 24 team members from number one to number 24, understanding and identifying and evaluating the top, the middle and the low performers. Look, this is not a time for underperformance. And when there's a recession, you're going to need your top performers, best performance. And you're going to need to lead, lean into who your top performers are. And if you ever really were to struggle through a recession and you needed to identify who the bottom performers were, if you ever unfortunately got to the point where you needed to cut some expenses, you need to be able to understand where they are, uh, who those people are. But most importantly is, you always measure in performance and you know who your top third is because that's who you're going to spend your most time with and that's who you're going to lean into for results. Okay, so wrapping up leadership here, this is the fifth, uh, you know, uh, part of conquering recession. Make sure you invest in your team's development. You train in opportunities it should be provided now more than ever. This is the opportunity. This is where separation is made during tougher times. Invest in your own professional development. You if you're a leader, you should be uh, investing in leadership programs. You should be reading. You should be listening to appropriate podcasts. You should be looking for virtual or in-person seminars to attend. You need to be investing in yourself because if you don't, you're the lid on the team you lead. And if you're not developing, they're never going, you're setting the cap on their success. And that's not fair for them. So you need to be stretching yourself. Uh, if you haven't already, you should seek an experienced mentor. This is not, even though they mean well, this is not the time to ask family and friends for professional advice that probably are not very qualified to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish in their business, in your business, unless they've accomplished what you're trying to accomplish or more. I would suggest that to work for me, invest in coaching. All the elite performers get coached. Without getting coached, you are not going to be an elite performer. You're not going to be an elite business leader. You're not going to be an elite leader. So as a leader, it's up to you to lead by example. So demonstrate your commitment to results and their success. If you do not invest in yourself for you, invest in yourself for your team. Hi, everyone. It's Melissa Sherman here. Uh, so Stephen was just talking about uh, the importance of investing in yourself, whether you're a business leader, you're a business owner, investing in your leaders as well. Well, this is an amazing uh, coaching offer. Stephen has successfully led many business owners um, leaders in those businesses as well through coaching sessions. And this offer here, it's regularly uh, $2,995, but there's a special offer today. Um, you can scan that QR code. There's also a link that is uh, in the chat there. It is $1,495 today. I highly recommend this. Um, Stephen has personally coached me uh, as well through business and mentored me. Um, I highly recommend it. 
Uh, Stephen will show you how to take the emotion out of it and be very logical and successfully move your business and your organization through recessions, but not only the bad times, the good times as well. Yeah, this is where like I just get more into the specifics of a particular situation of a business or a business owner and they can ask specific questions and how it applies to them and guide them through it and also help them find the resources if they're looking for different resources. But that's my passion is helping other business owners any way I can. That's why I wrote this that ebook that's you guys can download and I'm making myself available at a, at a discount offer now that I 50% off where I normally bill clients. Uh, because I know we're going, we're going to, my opinion is we're uh, going through some tougher times. Uh, so what I'd like to do here is just wrap this up, just summarize the key takeaways here that I have just to wrap, put a bow on this here, Melissa. Uh, so let's make sure we can get there. Okay. So conquer a recession takeaways. There's five here, right? One, number one is increase your business cycle awareness by monitoring the uh, leading indicators, whether they're internally in your organization or the external resources I provided, so you can proactively prepare uh, for a potential downturn, whether it's recession or just simply a contraction. Risk management and finances, remember your assets can become liabilities. This is counterintuitive, but think about which assets can become liabilities for my organization during a recession. Uh, third is marketing. You never stop marketing. This is an investment. You never stop investing. Just like you should never stop investing in yourself. You should never stop investing in your people. You should never stop investing in your organization. And you do that by marketing. Sales, increase output. You want it during a downturn, a recession, you want to grab market share and you make sure that you keep the morale up of your sales team. And finally, Leadership resilience, be the resilient example to your team that they need, especially when things are challenging. Okay, Melissa, th th that wraps it up. Uh, you know, we've got a couple minutes. Do we have any last minute questions here? Or are we all set? I think we covered everything. Uh, yes, we did. Again, that link is in the chat. Can you put that QR code back up? Yeah, I could do that. One last time for that amazing coaching offer. Scan that. You'll be able to get access right away, or the link is in the chat, as well as the playbook to get your copy today. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, happy recession hunting throughout the economy. But uh, if anybody wants to reach out to me, you can find me on Instagram at Steve A. Lags. A DM me or you can email us here or uh, sign up for my coaching and I'd definitely be happy to help you out here. So everybody enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks for joining us here on another TRC Power Show Live where we provide you the power to succeed.